Y'all, I'ma say it, I really cooked with this one. Welcome back everyone, hello if you are new here. My name is indeed Sip Sip Stefan, and this is the start of the unhinged recap of Honkai Star Rail. I am honestly so excited to bring you another wall full of lore, but this time it's going to be a bit different. Now, for those who do not know, my first lore wall was indeed for Genshin Impact, a mobile and PC game developed by Hoyoverse, all about siblings traveling through the world of Tavat in search for each other. I won't give you more than that because if you do want to view that series it is already being worked on up until part three which you can check out down below in the description what's different about this wall compared to the Genshin one is strategy now I went into this one knowing I was completely and absolutely fucked you see Genshin Impact focuses on a world like a globe Honkai Star Rail which is also another mobile and PC game developed by Hoyoverse takes place in space and no babes not the milky motherfucking way Oh, if we only had nine planets. And yes, I am saying nine planets. You Pluto erasure fucks in the comments. Do not start. If we only had nine planets, I would be fine. Right now, in Hawkeye Star Rail, in the current lore, there is a total of 52 known planets. Yeah, so this is a galaxy, possibly a multi-dimensional wide galaxy. I mean, let's be honest. I was also found multi-dimensional wide due to some of the men in this story. Long story short, there is a lot to cover. So I went into this one with a plan and indeed a grid. Now I know the wall seems a bit lopsided and I keep trying to fix that, but listen, I'm not straight. The wall will not be straight, but I already know I'm going to run out of wall by part three, but that's okay because you're going to love this video so much that you will feel absolutely guilted. You'll feel gutted to not hit that subscribe button and like button right now. I'll wait. I got all day and a whole wall to do. Hitting that button will not only push the YouTube algorithm to recommend this video to everybody and anybody, but who knows if it does well, Hoyoverse might promote it themselves, maybe. Now listen, I pray that this does well because the money that this video makes, I will be putting back into the studio so that we can get a new wall because the wall right there, you can't see it because it's off camera, is literally two and a half times the size of this one behind me. With that out of the way, it is time to talk to you about this week's sponsor, Dr. Ratio Vibrator. Absolutely joking, this video isn't actually sponsored. I just thought I would include that because all the major YouTubers for their videos are always sponsored and I just wanted to fit in. Maybe one day that can happen for us. But I will leave you with at least something from Dr. Ratio. Don't get excited, relax, it is not that. But it is a one-of-a-kind, Harvard-inspired Dr. Ratio sweater. Show off your faction pride with this Intelligentsia Guild wearable sweater. And also support the channel by grabbing one. I say wearable because a lot of the times when you're buying a merch most of the times it's not something you would wear out so I specifically designed these so they're cute and you won't really tell that they deal with Honkai Star Rail unless you're kind of in the know. Most likely you'll be mistaken for someone that just really likes math or ratios you know maybe a boy or girl or they them and be that you're interested in might see you in that sweater and be like oh my god I love math we should go on a date and get married. Now I'm not saying that's gonna happen to you if you buy one of these but it is always a chance. 10 out of 0 of you actually do back up all these claims though. Anyways, jump down into the description below to get all the links you need, including one for this merch and check it out and see if there's one in your size. Just letting you guys know a little bit of an update The people on Twitch already know this. The lore walls are here to stay and they are my new era. I'm focusing on YouTube this year. So thank you to all the support for anybody who has been following me for other types of content, but this is going to be the main thing. Anything else I used to do like guides and tier lists and all that you can find on the short side of this channel. Anyways, in this video, we're going to be going through the entire arc of the Hurtus space station in the story from start to finish, including the interludes. Now, unlike my previous video, we'll be doing actual mini deep dives on the characters and factions throughout the universe of Star Rail. So get ready to learn all the juicy details of everybody's past, presence, and future because I literally read every single piece of lore. Oh my god, the amount of time, the amount of pages, the amount of pointlessness, but honestly, it was really juicy. I'm gonna be honest, you guys, I wasn't really into the Honkai Star Rail lore because it was very confusing at the beginning and I'm hoping that this video will help clear things up but I'm telling you by the end of this video I was kind of like you know what there's a lot here to work with that doesn't really get talked about and I feel like Genshin was kind of like that in the start so Star Rail definitely has that potential. I feel this is a great time to tell you about this exciting update to the Sip Sip Squad Discord. If you didn't know the Discord hosts a ton of spaces for Hoyoverse games like Genshin Impact, Honkai Star Rail, and even Honkai Impact 3rd. What's even better is both Genshin and Star Rail have guide sections created by me where you can find a guide 
guide for every single character in the game. I actually just updated the entire Honkai Star World guide section for 2.0, meaning every single guide has been refreshed and tuned for the best builds going into Pentacony. Also, feel free to check out the updates channels for news, mains forums for some fun times with the community, or even the giveaway channel for a chance at some welkins or supply passes. So what are you waiting for? Drop down below in the description, grab a link to the Discord at discord.gg slash sipsipsquad, and jump into one of the many channels and join the ever-growing Sipsip Squad community. I have said all that can be said and delayed it as much as I can, so here we go into part number one of the unhinged recap of Honkai Star Rail. Honkai Star Rail opens up with Kafka and Silverwolf infiltrating the Herta Space Station. This is all happening as the Antimatter Legion wages an attack. During this opening, you can see members of the Herta Space Station scrambling to keep things under control while in the background, Canon in D is played. Now this is done as Kafka mimes herself like playing the violin. Now, interestingly enough, a canon in D is generally played at weddings or funerals, which leads me to believe that Kafka is somewhat celebrating the disastrous moments for the Herta space station. This girlie is literally welcoming their downfall. Now, before we move forward, let's talk about a few things that I just mentioned so you can get a bit more context. The Antimatter Legion is an intergalactic army led by the Aeon of Destruction named Nanook. They have a singular goal of destroying all life in a civilization throughout the entire galaxy. Now this army roams the entire universe, destroying worlds one by one, led by countless leaders of the Antimatter Legion. These leaders are currently known as Lord Ravengers, which are emanators of the Path of Destruction. Probably just confused you even more, so let me go further into detail with this. You may have previously heard me mention that Nanook is the Aeon of Destruction. Now what is an Aeon? Aeons and Honkai Star Rail are godly beings that are also described as higher dimensional. Now, what I mean by this is Aeons and Honkai Star Rail almost exist in a plane of space that is unrecognizable to our brain's current understanding of 3D space. So what this means is when an Aeon shows themselves to a mortal of Star Rail or a regular person, a non-godly being, it is more or less a projection of some sort and not their truest form. Aeons help to shape and destroy worlds, create history and change time and are an integral part of history within this universe. Now there are currently 18 known aeons with separate paths that they represent. Paths can be seen as almost specific domains in which these gods aka aeons rule over. So for instance the path of preservation is ruled by the aeon Klepoth. Don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Which is all about defending allies, sacrifice, and patience. If you ever played a game like Dungeons and Dragons or an RPG it's similar to how like deities or gods are like gods of a specific area. For instance, you could have like the god of mischief or like the god of the sun. This even applies to some religions or like sects of religions in real life. As previously mentioned, Nanook is the Aeon of Destruction. Now Nanook was born on the planet of Adlevin, also known as the Diamond Planet. Now Nanook actually witnessed the destruction of their home due to both the swarm and the mechanical wars. Due to this, they perceive the universe as a mistake and then sought out its destruction ascending into Aeonhood. Now recorded in history, in doing so they actually ignited their homeworld completely, leaving most likely nothing behind. Nanook is actually the most recently ascended Aeon and is currently the greatest known threat in the galaxy. Interestingly enough though, many researchers first questioned Nanook's birth, assuming that finality, the Aeon aka Terminus, already had the current domain of that similar path destruction. Now the factions currently under Nanook are the Antimatter Legion and the Annihilation Gangs. This along with the Emanators of Destruction known as Lord Ravengers make up our current understanding of the destruction as a whole. Now what are Emanators? Emanators are people, places, or things that have been bestowed power from one of the Aeons directly. This usually means they possess powers at a much higher level than their peers around them. Now in terms of the wall so you guys know how to read it, how I have laid it out this time because it is strategically placed. Most of the Aeons are all in a line both here and both on this side. So for instance, we have Akavili, Klepoth, and Thule. Now the sections are further divided in kind of like these rows here. So anything that deals with Akavili, basically downwards and then like over are all the characters here. And then anything that deals with Klepoth, which is a whole lot, which we will get to in mainly the next part, which is Bellabog, will 
will be in this section. So it's kind of like gridded out and then we kind of have the same thing going on on this side when it comes to like an Anuk and then for instance like Noose. And the main thing that I want you guys to take away also is that the middle I've kind of deemed as sort of like no man's land or like not sure what side things are on. Not that like everything on this side for instance is against this side, but mostly I've kind of put the more positive looking Aeons on this side and the more like negative ones on this side and the ones I'm not sure about yet are mainly in the middle until they decide to you know give us some more information now when it comes to emanators for every character you will see that there will be a path icon so again for instance Clopoth's path is preservation with the shield and I've decided to go ahead and when we do know a confirmed character is an emanator they also have the corresponding path icon that they are emanating from another example could be Thule who does have emanators known as a garden of recollection and one of the emanators is black swan I just hope this is like an easier way of reading the board instead of like kind of having all of the lines. Now the lines are on the board and they mainly are for like direct major relations between characters. Obviously I can't put every single relation because all of the characters within usually a general faction all know each other. So the lines are mainly things that are like a big deal. Back to the main storyline, Kafka after putting down her make-believe violin converses with Silverwolf. Now these first few lines of dialogue give us a lot of information that is super easy to glance over on first to read. Silverwolf refers to something known as system time, which most likely is the local time of that planetary system. That specifically in this case being the Hertus space station, which orbits the blue. When seeing the time, Silverwolf comments that Kafka is punctual, meaning she's just in time. Kafka then replies with, Elio always tells us the exact future. So what's with the explosion just now? Was that also part of his script? The Elio being referred to is a Stellaron Hunter and the leader of the Stellaron Hunter. Now more on this group later. Kafka lets us know that Elio actually has the ability to foresee the future to some degree. The future is constantly referred to as a script, like a movie or TV show script, for instance, giving us the impression that the events unfolding now are possibly in the future or even throughout the story really are all scripted to some degree. Silverwolf actually confirms that that the explosion was scripted to occur just before their arrival, further confirming that the events happening right now are going exactly as they thought. We continue moving forward as Kafka, taking down members of the Antimatter Legion as we continue to move through, meeting up with Silverwolf along the way. Now, Kafka, while exploring through her to space station, actually gives us a bit of additional information on some key members. Number one being Herta herself, who is the owner of this giant space station. Now, Herta is actually the emanator of Noose, who is the Aeon of Erudition. Now, stay with me, but Noose is actually a giant supercomputer that was created by Xander, the very first member of the Genius Society. The Genius Society is basically this world's version of great inventors, researchers, and scientists. Think people like Einstein, for instance. There are a ton of them throughout the universe of Honkai Star Rail, all handpicked. Well, not really handpicked. He doesn't have hand. I actually don't know if he has hands. That's not confirmed or denied, but they are picked directly by Noose themselves. Now today there are currently 84 members and Herta is actually number 83. I'm really hoping that the 84 are never lore relevant because I am no way going to fit 84 people from one faction on this wall. Kafka comments on how young Herta looks, but then remarks that Herta was rather famous already in the previous Amber era, making her much older than she appears. She lets us know that if her coach calculations are correct, that means that she has to be at least a hundred or so years old. Now this actually gives us some interesting information on the passing of time within Star Wars Universe and how it's recorded. On Earth, we are used to the passing of time pretty consistently at one year being about 12 months. But in the world of Star Rail, due to the vastness of space, it seems a large majority of people have conformed to a new measure of time, that being Amber Years. Amber Years seem to date back as far to when Klopoth became the Aeon of Pre Preservation. Apparently the time per amber year ranges between 76 to 240 years, depending on how fast or slow Klopoth swings their hammer. So you can just kind of think of it like a giant space god, like swinging their hammer to like do something and then swinging it again, like in between that is one amber year. Now we currently know that the game story starts in the 2157th amber year, which is 
right there. Klopoth is all about preserving the world with one of their main feats being the creation of the subspace crystalline barrier, which separates actually the living world from the devourers. Klopoth ascended during something called the Dusk War, which seems to be a war between the Dusk Leviathans and possibly the first beings of the universe. The Dusk Wars aren't super covered at this point in the story, so currently the Dusk Leviathans are up here related to Ouroboros, another Aeon that we will get into in a little bit. Klopoth also strives for planetary isolation. Although this isn't really explained, I assume the reasoning is that they think planets and civilizations who remained isolationists will obviously never partake in mass destruction, preserving life across the universe. So basically, if everyone stays in their bubble, there won't be any problems. I'm pretty sure Klopoth could probably go and talk to the people of Inazuma from Genshin Impact and know quickly why that tends to not work out some times. Now Silverwolf actually gives us a little bit of more key information on some members of the Genius Society. The first being Xander, who was the one to create the Genius Society and Noose and was the first genius in history. Again, this is all recorded history, so there's probably a lot of bias and things that we don't know about. Now legends say he did create an Aeon himself, but his current status to my knowledge is unknown. This does give us a bit of insight on Aeons and their possible origins, with some seemingly being created by really smart people. I'm gonna be honest, this definitely seems like something that will be explored later on in the story because a godly entity being created from a computer seems a bit fishy to me. Plus, you would think that the person who created the godly entity would almost be godly themselves to some degree, so there's still a lot to be explained. Now, Noose is the Aeon of Erudition and is an astral supercomputer, like I said earlier. Noose seems to be focused on calculating the essence and answers in the universe to find its ultimate solution. You could say it is on a quest to know the ultimate truth of this world. The Genshin girl is be screaming and creaming with that reference, by the way. Interestingly enough, though, Noose actually stopped its pursuit on these answers during the second prosperity. I'm not going to go super into detail with that because honestly, there isn't a ton of it. It was basically just an era in time in which there was a math growth of prosperity, productivity, technology, and expansion. You could kind of think of it like the Industrial Revolution on Earth, but like in a different degree or matter. We don't actually know know why new stop so I am keeping an eye on you Mr. Supercomputer because I'm sure that's going to come up somewhere. Moving back though to the Genius Society, the fourth member Polka, Kakamond I think, is known by Silverwolf and mostly everyone as the Lord of Silence. She apparently destroyed nearly all evidence of her identity by destroying any statuses or images of herself. So the image that you actually see has a sort of like glitch error across her face which is found in game. It is also said that many members of the Genius Society have possibly died at her hand. And currently to most members, she is alive and at large. The last member that we get information on is Skrulim, which is number 76 in the members of the Genius Society. Kafka actually refers to him as Silverwolf's opponent. And we come to learn that Silverwolf was scouted by Elio, the leader of the Celeron Hunters, through an actual like hacking slash computer battle with Skrulim. That's some comp size shit right there. And that is absolutely embarrassing. Silverwolf was one of the few people though who were able to crack through both Skrulim and Herta's code, making her an extremely valuable asset within the Stellaron Hunters. As Kafka enters into the reception area, she quickly deals with a few more members of the Antimatter Legion before Civil Wolf appears physically to warp out the last remaining ones. Kafka does seem impressed by Silverwolf, but Silverwolf themselves kind of sees them as a typical day in the life as a hacker and reality bender. Silverwolf actually explains to us that the ship is filled with Herta's toys, including a rare item that will let them locate where the Celeron is. Pressing forward after another fight with some Antimatter Legion members, they arrive within the monitoring room. The entire floor and the monitoring room are completely empty due to an evacuation order being put through by the acting lead researcher, which is Asta. Now, Kafka doesn't seem to know anything specifically about Asta, but remembers that Elio let them know that they wouldn't have to deal with Herta, which further confirms the accuracy of his future telling abilities. We also learned they weren't given direct information as to where the Stellaron would be. Both Silverwolf and Kafka infer from this that if Elio foresees them getting the Stellaron, they must have obtained it in a non-physical way. It seems the power of Elio's perceptions into the future may have limits and workarounds. You can simply think of Elio like Alice and Herta like Jacob. And she fucking stinks. So whenever she tries to see Bella, which is the Stellaron, because of again, stinky Jacob being a bit too close to Bella. Get it? 
Good. Silverwolf then tells Kafka to help her investigate the monitoring room to see if anything will give them a clue as to where the Stellaron could be located. They search through surveillance cameras and don't see anything physically, and the memory of the computers are found to be conveniently wiped. Now, Silverwolf quickly gets fed up and hacks into the system, displaying her signature hacker logo across all the screens in the monitoring room. This is done one with immense ease, but the girlie actually doesn't even physically go up to any computer. She literally mentally hacks into the system. Again, showing some of the crazy powers these people have within the Stellaron Hunter team. As Kafka investigates her findings, and we come to learn that Herta used something called a curio called Blind Spot that has the ability to allow objects within it to pass unnoticed. I'm not going to go into all the curio lore because honestly it's a little bit confusing, but basically you can think of them as sort of like these magical little items or things that have abilities to do stuff. And the ability for Blind Spot is to allow items to go unlocated or pass unlocated within its field. It seems like Herta was actually trying to hide the Stellaron in plain sight because most people would have probably expected some grand plan from someone as smart as Herta when she came to concealing the Stellaron. Now the Curio actually has an added layer of holographic distorting with the room and although Kafka and Silverwolf don't really understand the technology behind this they decide to put their trust in Elio knowing that obviously his script says they are going to get the Stellaron and they decide to warp into the room with the Stellaron. As Kafka approaches the Stellaron, we come to learn that the main goal for the Stellaron hunters is the Stellarons themselves, at least to outsiders of the faction. Kafka, though, continues to let us know that Elio, Silverwolf, and someone named Blade, a Stellaron hunter that isn't mentioned till now and you will know more about in the future, that they all have an actual secret goal in mind, a true goal. The Stellaron Kafka and Silverwolf come upon will actually have another intended use other than its original, and will be instead placed in a vessel. The vessel being you, the player character. Apparently that has been waiting for this very moment. I've decided to put the player character as usual in the middle because at the end of the day, we're the main character. Like the story's going to revolve around us. Silverwolf hacks into Herta's protection of the Stellaron and removes it swiftly. Kafka then interacts with the Stellaron grabbing it as Silverwolf readies the receptacle. And Kafka decides on both its gender and name while Silverwolf specifically states that Kafka must be the one to make these choices. This most likely, again, is referring back to Ilio's script and things having to be done exactly according to plan. The decision is made, and from now on, you're going to be known as the Trailblazer. Kafka actually asks Silverwolf how much we will remember, and she lets them know that they will at least remember Kafka. Just as we apparate into the space, Kafka lovingly places her hand on our lower back before literally fisting the Stellaron into our chest. I feel like there's like an easier way of doing this. Like it looks kind of violent. Like I get that she like did it in a sexy way, but we're still getting fisted. Like I don't think you can get fisted in a sexy way. As we come to though, we open our eyes and are met with Kafka who is somewhat physically recognizable. Kafka lets us know that she is aware that we kind of remember her and understands if we're questioning if we should trust her. We also come to know we don't really know what we are or who we are or where we are or what we are or what even we're supposed to be doing, but we're told that none of that matters. She goes on to let us know to expect a future filled with adventure and companions and plenty of moments that will eventually answer many of our questions. And apparently some of those answers will be good and bad. She ends with letting us know that this is the future that Elio has seen for us and if we are happy or excited about it. Now, interestingly enough, she does add in that although this future does exist, it is still up to us to make those decisions. She finally leaves us with a warning telling us to trust our gut when the time comes and make a choice we won't regret. Why are we being so cryptic? Like, literally, I don't understand. Like, I'm just thinking right now, what is the likelihood that we do everything exactly as Elio would want in making that future correct if we don't even have some guidance? This is all told to us very quickly before she heads off with Silverwolf to avoid the eyes of the incoming Astral Express. So let's just quickly recap. We got zero clue who, what, where, when, why the fuck we exist. And yet here we are having to live. Damn, that kind of sounds like me in real life, actually. Hold on. Also, side note, I just want to mention the weirdness that we have some sort of unknown past behind us that Kafka and the Stellaron Hunters seem to be aware of. Obviously, if we have the ability to recognize Kafka physically to some degree or have some sort of memories, there definitely is a time before the main storyline that something has happened with us and we don't know about 
about it. This is definitely one of the biggest questions I have about us as a character is who the hell we are before all of this. Interestingly enough, this also correlates with Genshin with a similar character background to the main character of having a past that they don't really know about and that doesn't fully add up. So keep that in mind. All right, now quick break for some Stellaron Hunter lore. The Stellaron Hunters are one of the major factions in Honkai Star Rail and collect Stellarons and work against the capitalistic scumbags of the world known as the Interstellar Peace Corporation, AKA the IPC. Now, Elio is the founder of the Stellarons here in the middle, and he's known in the game as Destiny's Slave. Yeah, interesting name choice, not one that I would have personally picked. He is our future teller and mysterious entity, almost comes off as omniscient. There's actually little known about him currently, but it seems that he did recruit Kafka first before working with Kafka to get the other members of the team. He obviously also knows who we are, and gave Kafka access to us so that she could initiate this storyline that we are partaking in. Now, moving over to Kafka, Kafka is one of Elio's most trusted subordinates and is also the most wanted for the IPC. And honestly, for fun, let's read out her charges. Responsible for the following infractions, the Pierpoint Incursion, two counts, the Pierpoint Heist, the Trobby's Disappearance, the Stellaron Events of Jamors, Bejana, Shilla 39C, Almora, Seven Midla, Lore 51, and Droz. Cyber attacks against Pierpoint, four counts of that. Cyber attacks against Planet Skrulem, Cyber attacks against the Hurt to Space Station, and the Japella Rebellion. Now, she's also suspected to be relating to the following infraction the Stellaron events of Sishlea and Nepis. O1G7, Zakov, Lidovia, Lily, Atoni, and Buyama, with a bounty placed on her head at a mere 10.9 billion dollars. It's actually credits in this game. Um, That's the currency that they use, but it's the same thing. I mean, all I'm hearing is that she's booked and busy, but pop off, I guess, IPC. Now, one of the most dangerous aspects of Kafka is actually her ability called Spirit Whispers. This allows her to hypnotically manipulate others through speech. We're not exactly sure where this power developed, but most likely it was from her past on her home planet, Partigas 5, where she was a devil hunter. Silverwolf is a genius hacker that has mastered a skill known as Aether Editing. Now this allows her to tamper with the data of reality, meaning she can basically manipulate matter into any form that she sees fit. Now Silverwolf is mainly connected to the planet Punk Lord. It's a cyberpunk hacker world with a ton of bright lights and a ton of gaming RGB and host hacker legends from across the universe. Now Silverwolf never really fit in at Punk Lord due to there being a culture of everyone kind of working in teams where she was more of the loner type. Eventually, obviously, she is recruited by the Stellarun Hunters and seems to possibly be the most recent addition based on the current lore that we have. Back to the story though, the Trailblazer, aka us, awaken on the floor of the Herta space station and hanging over our heads, debuting the wonderful duo that they are and it ministering mouth to mouth is none other than Don Hung and March 7th. We are starting the story strong with Bi Panic and we love to see it. After telling them our name, we're informed of the ongoing attacks from the Antimatter Legion. March 7th though does indeed reassure us that the space station shouldn't have a problem taking out the Legion, especially since there doesn't seem to be any Lord Ravengers that have joined them on this attack. Friendly refresh, Lord Ravengers are again the emanators of destruction. Marge and Don Hung let us know that we should make our way back to the master control zone as that is where the Astral Express is parked. Now this is where we realize that they're actually part of the Astral Express crew and not the Herta Space Station crew. I just want to make that clear. It actually seems like there's an ongoing deal between Herta and the Astral Express crew that allows them to visit often. Don Hung actually decides to go off on his own in search of Arlen, which is indeed the leader of security. You and Marge then reach the elevator that takes you down to the master control zone only to realize it's broken. At this point though, Don Hung does indeed catch up to us, informing us that Arlen is in the control center and is wounded, but stable. We decide then that the best course of action is to head over to the control center in hopes that Arlen can give us some information on the elevator and possibly help us get down to master control. We reach the control center and Arlen asks if the Astral Express was specifically sought out to help with the Legion. As March explains that it was just a coincidence 
coincidence and that they were there at the same time, we also come to find out that the real reason the Astral Express was at the Herta space station was because they had to drop off a rare relic for Herta. Now, Arlen lets us know that the Antimatter Legion arrived right as the security system in the space station went down. Interesting suspicious. The elevators were shut down to prevent the Legion though from getting deeper into the space station and to protect everyone within the master control zone. Arlen then asks the Astral Express crew if they were given an access card by Asta since they were sent to help her and that's when March realizes that she had the elevator access the entire time. As you can see John Hung is the brains of the operation and March was indeed the personality hire of the Astral Express crew. Arlen helps us unlock the elevator, but only unlocks the entrance on the highest floor to hopefully avoid any of the members of the Legion getting into the master control zone. Before we leave though, Don Hung does question Arlen asking about the Legion's motives on this attack. He even further questions if it's possible they could be after the Stellaron that Herta has. Arlen lets us know that he actually doesn't even have enough access to know anything about that, but this does give us some key information and insight into the information and knowledge that the Astral Express crew has, which is a lot more than we probably thought up until this point. As we make our way to the highest floor, we come across something called a light cone. Really hope that this is in frame. Light cones in Hawkeye Star Roll are mainly just for combat, but they do have a bit of lore, of course. One being that the technology actually comes from something called the Garden of Recollection. We'll be diving more into the Garden of Recollection in the future. Another interesting point is the IPC has actually paid the Garden of Recollection for the usage rights of light cones. Also more details on the IPC later as well. Upon approaching the elevator, the group is then ambushed by a large locust-like swarm of Legion members. But thankfully, the wonderful space mother Himiko is there for the rescue. And she comes with a giant chainsaw purse, which is always really great for moments like this. Himiko introduces herself as the navigator for the Asso Express and the entire group finally make their way towards the master control zone to meet up with acting lead researcher Asta. As we get there though, Asta is completely overwhelmed dealing with tracking incoming waves of Legion attacks while barking out orders to the rest of the crew. She does though thank the Astro Express crew for their help and reassures us that the space station has taken minimal damage at this point. Asta is actually more worried about the morale on the ship after after the Legion attack than the actual attack itself. And do keep this in mind because it does come up later in the story, like way later, we're talking six patches later, this actually ends up turning around. Obviously though, everyone on the ship at the Herta space station are mainly researchers and not people of war or soldiers. So they'll probably be pretty shaken up by the sudden invasion. Himiko asks if we can actually speak to the researchers ourselves and also asks Asta if she's contacted Herta yet. It is actually here that we learn that this giant space station is merely a toy to Herta. Asta informs us although she attempted to contact Herta, she has not received a reply back. Himiko then decides she will also send a message in hopes that she'll get a response back due to the fact that the Astral Express does have a rare item that she's interested in. Honestly, I find this kind of crazy to think about now. This space station probably houses hundreds of people and yet Herta could really care less what happens to it. She even houses a Stellaron upon the ship and yet still pays little to no mind. It honestly really makes me wonder what the real Herta is up to and what she even looks like and where she's even at. Now, just some mini breakdowns. Asta is actually our rich girl that struggles with being seen for her accomplishments. Interesting fact, but Asta and Arlen have been friends for years. And the reason being that Arlen asked Asta for money, being one of the first people to say that he would pay her back. That's apparently literally the only reason. She was so rich that no one thought that they even really needed to pay her back, but Arlen was a nice and enough to suggest it. Another thing that we do know is Herta specifically sought out Asta for the position of lead researcher and to run the space station, meaning she definitely looks upon her highly, even though she doesn't tend to show it all the time. Arlen is the head of security and puts a ton of trust into Asta. He vows to protect the space station and its researcher with his life. We do learn in his additional notes that during the Legion attack, he actually almost died trying to protect the people within the master control zone from the Legion. 
Legion and them getting down the elevator. This was actually the first time he's ever gone against Asta and her suggestions or things she said. And you can definitely tell that Arlen puts a ton of value into the relationship. Arlen comes off rather cold and it's said that people only catch him smiling when playing with Peppy the dog. Now a quick chat with Himiko, we also come to learn that the Astral Express crew follows Akavili, the Aeon of the Trailblaze. And Himiko also lets us know that the Garden of Recollection, who were the ones that made the light cones, follow the Aeon fully, the Aeon of Remembrance. Now these light cones are apparently made up of refined memory fragments, meaning the light cones are powered through past experiences, hence why they grant abilities to the users. Now it also seems like Himiko has some personal theories on who we are. She lets us know for now that she'll keep those theories to herself until she gets more information. Conversations are cut short suddenly as the Doomsday Beast appears and attacks the space station, attempting to breach through its shields. Asta quickly tells you to make your way to the Astro Express and Himiko does not hesitate telling us to follow her out. Outside the Master Control Zone, we actually lose contact with Asta due to communications failing. Now, Don Hung insists on leaving Leaving, but March struggles with the idea of abandoning the space station. Interestingly enough though, Himiko actually agrees with the Don Hung in this case and insists that they take us on the Astral Express. Now this is where Don Hung hits the brakes and starts questioning why we, the Trailblazer, are so significant. We come to learn that Himiko sees us as someone who can turn the tides, almost like someone who can change fate. Interesting. Wonder who else can do that? We quickly make our way through the supply zone to the railway platform to meet up with Welt. And although Himiko thinks that they can handle a doomsday beast, she worries about an emanator of the destruction joining in on this attack and making it a lot worse. As March sprints towards the train, she is intercepted by the doomsday beast who has managed to get past the space station shields. The Astral Express crew and yourself directly engage with the beast and as the fight progresses, the beast loses control and launches a laser beam directly at March. Seeing this and being the main character hero that you are, you decide to put yourself in between March and the beam of energy. Your mind is then quickly transported in front of the Aeon of Destruction Nanook. An ominous voice calls out to you telling you to push forward and reach the end of your story before letting you know that they have already noticed you. As you come back to reality though, the Stellaron within you reacts violently pushing away both March and the Beast as your body ascends into the air. Like we are going full exorcism moment and listen, Welt is having none of it. He sees us losing control and before anything can get out of hand, Welt arrives and taps you upon the head with his staff, suddenly everything stops. It seems what he or that long, thick, suspicious staff did seems to have worked and returned us to normal, unconscious in March 7th arms. Welt does let the Astral Express crew know that we're fine and to talk about this somewhere else. Seems like he's a bit embarrassed about us, to be honest. He's kind of like, oh god, now everyone's gonna be talking about us, which I totally get. Like, that would be embarrassing. I mean, come on now. Anyways, we awaken to March 7th and Don Hung who let us know that the Doomsday Beast has been handled and that Himiko is awaiting us. We do exchange phone numbers at this point for easier communication and head out. Now as you and Himiko are about to speak, you're actually interrupted by Herta in the flesh. Somewhat, Herta is actually able to use puppets to interact with the space station directly. Herta already seems to be aware that there is a stellar one within us and is just as intrigued about us due to our body having the ability to stabilize it. She lets us know that the space station was actually originally built for the sole purpose of holding the Stellaron and preventing disaster. This disaster would have occurred on the planet the Blue, which again, the space station orbits. She then asks Himiko if we can be involved in some of her current studies, and Himiko says it's up to us at this point. I'm gonna be honest though, Herta doesn't really give us a choice on this manner, even if you do say no. Himiko though, make sure to remind us before we head off with Herta that there is a space for us on the Astral Express and that we can always come back to the Herta space station whenever we decide to check on 
Herta and her current studies. We decide to quickly check in with Herta and see what her plans are before making a final decision if we're gonna stay on the space station or go off with the Astral Express crew. Upon questioning Herta further though, we find out that she has a total of 249 puppet versions of herself and 32 backups of said puppet versions. Virgil also tells us about her massive new project all about the Aeons and coming to an understanding of who and what they are and how to become an Aeon. Herta actually teamed up with four other members of the Genius Society to create the simulated universe. Number one, this is pretty much unheard of. Geniuses tend to keep to themselves and don't really do things in teams. Also, the simulated universe is basically a world beyond our own that is fully customizable and also fully interactable with. Now, before we jump into all the simulated universe stuff, let's talk about Herta, because Herta's actually extremely interesting. Now, not only is she the emanator of news, she also owns the entire space station and has an insanely long list of achievements over her entire lifespan of things that she's invented. The Herta that we see though on the space station is a puppet version of her younger self that is able to be controlled remotely from wherever she is, which we currently do not know. Some interesting backstory lore to Herta. Herta was actually commissioned by the IPC to write a manuscript and within it we come to see a different version of Herta than the one presented outwardly to most. Herta Herta generally comes off as a self-interested, research-driven genius and knows that she's smarter than every person in the room and isn't really afraid to let others know that. In her manuscript, though, we see a more curious side of Herta, one with, like, fascination and wonder, especially about the unknowns of the world that she has yet to answer. Now listen, she doesn't get that sentimental in that manuscript because she does go on to list some of her accomplishments, including solving solitary wave theory and the spark theory hypothesis discovering conversion methods for sigma variants, and solving secrets behind the imaginary leakage. That one is the one I want to know the most about personally. The other ones, I don't even know what she's saying. <laughs> Honestly, I'm convinced that Genshin and Hawkeye Star will create their own words and their own things, like, out of nowhere. She was also one of the few people to have captured and housed a Stellaron, saving her own planet from apocalyptic destruction. I don't think there's any doubt at this point that Herta will continue to be a prominent character throughout the storyline of Hawkeye Star Rail, especially if we do eventually end up meeting her true self, meaning her older self, or the one that's currently in the timeline and not the puppets. Herta lets us know that this experience only actually happened in our mind like we aren't physically going to the simulated universe so our body will remain in the office Herta has it programmed so in the simulation it will regard us as Akavili the Aeon of the Trailblazer in hope that the other Aeons will interact with us thinking that we are an Aeon she basically thinks that in gaining their trust we will also gain the secrets of the world now upon our first interactions within the simulated universe we are met briefly with the gaze of Kilpoth I feel like it keeps saying that name differently. <laughs> now, Herta lets us know that the Aeons within the simulated universe are also simulated, and those were created by both Ron May and Screwlum. Now, as we reach the end of the simulation, Herta is disappointed as it doesn't seem likely that another Aeon will fall for the same tricks. And just as she's about to pull us out of the simulation, Fooly does indeed appear before us. Now, Fooly displays a barrage of memories at you, including images of Kafka. And this all happens happens right before you are suddenly transported into the point of view of Nanook, the Aeon of Destruction. Now, from this first person view, we briefly see a glimpse of Nanook's early life, including his golden scar in golden blood flowing all over the dead planet that we did indeed mention earlier. We come to find out that Fooly also believed that we were Akavili and tried to start a conversation with us. Now, I think what we experienced within our actual brain was an interpretation of the conversation between the Aeon. Now this is some outside lore or real life lore or maybe like other literature lore but it is said in other forms of literature that humans or mortals would struggle to even comprehend the things gods would say to us or show us. So this is why I feel like the rapid memory shooting through our brain could be our perception of the conversation but not actually exactly what was said. Now we are pulled out of the simulated universe and Herta lets us know she's going to rush an upgrade for the simulated universe in hopes of new discoveries. Discoveries. I guess we've kind of just opened Pandora's box. I think it's really interesting to think about the fact that the simulated universe has simulated aeons. Like they're able to kind of create 
fake versions of these gods and they have enough information that they can kind of make these AI versions of them almost give up information. It's a bit weird and I don't really understand the whole back end of it, especially in terms of like from a coding perspective, if this is really possible, but I mean, it's make-believe. Now, we do learn that Stellarons are tethered to a certain path or Aeon and tend to respond to civilization's desires to advance. For the Hawkeye girlies, I feel like this is very similar to that as well, so I wouldn't be surprised if Celeron has some connections with Honkai. Now, Herta still believes that the mechanism is related to the Nook regardless, but basically what she's saying is it doesn't technically need to be a Celeron from the Nook. Technically, any Aeon could make one. Now, before heading back to Himiko, we chat with Asta, who updates us on the current status of the space station. When Kafka inserted the Celeron into us, it actually created a space within the ship of Fragmentum Corrosion. Fragmentum is basically a residue left from Stellaron activity. And Fragmentum space is all interconnected, meaning it can be used by Fragmentium monsters to travel and enter between the space station and wherever they're coming from. You can basically think of it like a giant wormhole or wherever Fragmentum exists. Due to this though, for the time being, security will be on high alert for her to space station. When meeting back up with the Astral Express crew, you do have the option to decline joining them, but this literally just ends your playthrough temporarily. If you click that option, you go to a screen and it lets you know that the Astral Express and the Stellarons go on without you, only for them to die in a distant future. It even tries to guilt you a bit by letting you know that maybe if you chose differently, there could have been a different end for the people of the Astral Express and the whole universe, honestly. It actually makes you re-log in and it resets your progress back to the point right before you made the decision, but this time you aren't allowed to not do it. You have to go through with the Astral Express. Hemiko before taking us on the train does give us a bit of a speech looking forward into our self-discovery. Besides the mysteries behind the Stellaron, it seems like the Astral Express are all about following in the footsteps of Akavili. And this includes the stop on Akavili's path. Now in patch 1.6, we did receive an update to her to space station quests as an interlude. This interlude was an update updated in 2.0 and placed in the timeline before the Astro Express goes on to the next planet. With Herta's recent excitement around the simulated universe and its new discoveries, she decides to invite both Ron May and Skrulim to the space station. It's very rare that this many members of the Genius Society are all in one place, so the entire space station prepares for this moment. It's like the Oscars of smart people, if that's even like a thing. Wait, when they give away a Nobel Prize to like some smart person, is it a huge deal? I'm really smart enough to know these things, but like do they have similar like award ceremonies? Wait, has anyone ever like gone up for a Nobel Prize and then some random audience member comes up and is all like, I'ma let you finish, but Bohr Rutherford had the best atomic model of all time. Genuinely interested in knowing if there's like smart people or like inventor drama. Herta lets us know though that Ron May borrowed something called the phase flame to do some research previously. Now Ron May seems to focus on studies of both life and ecology and even has some previous success of taking a barren inhabited planets into large bustling ecosystems filled with life. Now we make our way back to the railway platform to spot Ron May looking out onto the planet below called the Blue. Now as we approach her before even getting a word out she presses her two fingers against our throat doing a complete unauthorized lymphatic system check on us. Consent was not asked like babes even the girlies who do the fake exams for ASMR videos ask for consent. Ron May does have the unique ability though to touch someone and understand their construction as a living organism. She lets us know though to not be concerned as we are perfect and a great experiment specimen. Okay, Aro from Twilight. Now as we observe the blue planet down below, Ron May offers us a dessert and although we have the option to decline regardless of which you pick, you end up eating this dessert again with the last lack of consent. Ron May then asks us if we recall what her research is about and we go to answer biology and our character instead says toilets. Now we mentally take note of this personal disconnect between our thoughts and what is actually verbalized, but we don't mention that part out loud. It's more like an inner thought. We're kind of like, what the fuck just happened? But Ron May does indeed notice our like bewildered look, like the what the fuck 
look on her face. And then she lets us know that if that happens again, we better mask our expression or it'll give away what's going on. What is going on, babes? I literally just had a chocolate covered strawberry. What do you mean? Ronmei then goes on a bit of a yap fest, refusing to elaborate on what she just spoke about. She finally decides though to come clean and tells us that she was informed by Herta of our arrival and took great interest in us since then, wanting for us to become her assistant. Apparently though, little Miss Ronmei has some trust issues and doesn't think we won't blab to everyone or anyone about her research. Now for once she's right because I actually can't keep a secret. So that's true. But Ronmei admits at this point to adding anti-truth serum into our chocolate strawberries, preventing us from answering any questions about Ronmei, truthfully. So casual drugging, assault, force feeding. Wow, this list is getting Kafka long at this point, Ronmei. Anyways, she lets us know that assisting her will come with rewards and that this research is focused on the Genius Society number 29's invention of the Face Flame. Ronmei seems to be cultivating life on the space station, creating species from almost thin air. Apparently though, they're kind of dumb or at least not as smart as they thought they'd be. Now listen, I don't think I'd ever really relate to Ron May personally. But honestly, same girl, because when I was a kid, I asked my parents for a sibling because I was like really bored and I think it was like five or six at the time. And my parents actually did end up getting me a sibling. But the problem was I was six years old and thought that the kid that my parents was gonna get me was gonna be the same age as me. So when I did end up getting my sister, I was pissed because all she did was like obviously poop and sleep because she was a baby. And I was not very impressed with that. So I can relate to this a bit about being disappointed by creations of others or your own. Well, it wasn't my own, but still. Now, let's be honest though. My sister hasn't changed much from now till that age. She still does the same thing. Sleep, poop, and do nothing. Ronmei decides to leave the critters in our hands, more on them later, and expects us to go around collecting them and finding a suitable place for them within this space station. Don't we love when parents just drop their literal children on random people? At this point, we make our way to the Department of Ecology in hopes of finding some answers as to where these critters might be stored. When questioned further on why we want this information, any attempt at mentioning Ronmei in this quest line ends up coming with an embarrassing reply instead, including us calling one of the researchers Q. We need that like ejection room from the TV show The 100 for Ron May specifically because the level of secondhand embarrassment that I felt throughout doing this entire quest. Eventually the ecology department realizes what we're going on about and lets us know to check out the storage zone for more information. It seems this whole issue is being kept under tight lip right now. After talking to a few more researchers who yap at various lengths of bringing life to inanimate objects, we find a thing, I guess you could say, called the Molten Cheese Tart, who is one of Ron May's biggest fans and one of their creations. Now, in order to get Cheese Tart to show themselves, we have to actually bend the knee to their level and show a level of admiration to Ron May. For instance, graffitiing a bunch of hearts on the walls nearby. After creating an embarrassing shrine to Ron May, Molten Cheese does indeed appear, and what do you know, it's a a literal cheese tart that somehow has like sentient life like it speaks it talks it moves now by speak i mean it woofs and we can't really understand it but a nearby researcher hooks up the synthesia beacon in order to translate it for those who don't know they did develop technology apparently in the world of star rail that is basically able to translate any amount of languages out there into your own so that like different species from different parts of the universe are able to converse without them having to literally learn every single language pretty sure that comes from the intelligence Intelligentsia Guild, by the way. The cheese tart seems completely adoring of its creator, Ron May, and also seems to be on a quest for her approval. So basically, like any child raised in a neglectful or absent home, wow, this is really hitting the nose on realism. We get word of a creation called Grey Bean Paste that seems to be Molten Cheese's enemy. Molten Cheese runs away shortly after, and we get a text from the ecology research team letting us know that we can dump the creations we find in a nearby toilet. 
which apparently has a one-way passage to the room they're being kept in. As usual, the game of Starwell continues to be unserious at all times. Now, we get our hands on one of them and put them in the toilet, and it lovingly looks back at us. We obviously flush it out of the room and out of existence, though. Like, I'm sorry, little guy, but I am here to get paid. We then return back to Ron May to let them know about our progress, and Ron May lets us know that Herta, Skrulem, and her will be having a meeting with Stefan, another genius society member but unfortunately to talk about the simulated universe but unfortunately stefan couldn't show up so ron may is asking to bring us along and by asking, I mean, she's just dragging us. We actually, again, do not have an option of yes or no here. Now, at the meeting with the three geniuses, that being Herta, Raname, and Skrulem, they discuss bringing another partner in for the simulated universe. Raname mentions that putting in an open call could have a response come back from Polka, the member with the reputation of possibly killing other geniuses. Interestingly enough, though, Herta seems open to her joining and kind of wants to know who she is. I personally find it interesting that Herta does not fear Poke at all, so she clearly thinks that if anything were to go down, she could deal with it. Skrulem then brings up the possibility of Dr. Primitive joining the simulated universe team, and Herta is very against that option. Now, Dr. Primitive is in the naughty books with the IPC and on top of that with the Galaxy Rangers. And Herta says that she just wants to keep herself and the simulated universe out of the media mainly. The group then brings up Ching Tzu and asks Ron May if she's still in contact with her or if she's even alive. And suddenly Ron May asks if the trailblazer could leave before delving into this further. <sighs> And we're escorted out. Now that is sus. Like what is up with that? What is going on here? Why can't we know? She's literally the one that dragged us to this meeting. And now all of a sudden when eyes are on her and she's in the hot seat, she starts to stutter. So Rame decides to distract us by letting us know that there's actually a sealed area of the space station due to the recent attacks from the antimatter legion. Apparently in these sealed sections though of the space station are the rest of her creations. She then hands us a brand new access pass and of course we end up making our way there to recover the rest of them. This access pass actually makes us descend the farthest we've ever been in the Herta space station. Now going into the lower sections of the storage zones, we are greeted by an abandoned research area. And there is a lone mini robot that is creepily malfunctioning and like twitching in the air with error codes when we arrive. The room then suddenly lights up though and along the walls and all of the railings are just like warning signs and red alerts making people know that they probably shouldn't be in here if they did stumble in here. So I guess this is kind of like the mini horror area of Honkai Star Rail and its story. Interestingly enough, when interacting with the little robot, we get a message letting us know that they are there to welcome galactic visitors and alien species. Lovely. It's alien versus predator now. Great. The storage area though is currently being used to store the most dangerous curios that Herta owns, so what could possibly go wrong? Throughout investigating this area, you come across previous logs from Ron May's research that let us know the phase flame had completely vanished from her possession, along with more side studies on critters and their innate need to yearn for their creator. Now, exploring further, we find the infamous gray bean paste creation, the one that Molten Cheese had a ton of beef with. And upon talking to it, I really did believe we're gonna walk into some like Chad paste, but um, actually it's depressed. It constantly talks about being a failure, especially in its creator's eyes, and we're literally unable to convince it otherwise. This entire lot, like this entire room of creations has a case of major imposter syndrome, these poor things. She honestly should be locked up for this, like all these poor little sad creatures that she could care less about. Now, as I said, Ron May's studies are littered throughout this area, and its focus seems to be understanding life and its commonalities between different beings. She's looking for the thing that everything possesses, but it's unknowing. Like it's just an innate thing that all living beings share. At the far end though of one of the zones, we reach a secret sealed chamber that we managed to gain access to. Upon scanning Ron May's access card, we are able to check the previous log histories. The previous records have a voice memo left by Ron May and she rambles like a crazy scientist about emanators and her inability to comprehend what one is. She dives deeper into the topic, trying to understand its conception and when the idea of emanators truly began. It then goes on to talk about her failing to create a genius and pivots to her thinking more on a primitive path. 
especially when it comes to comparing paths and starting with erudition. This leads her to Tazaroth, the Aeon of Propagation. This is legit the god of fucking. I wish I was lying, but that's what it means. It literally means to like duplicate, to replicate, to reproduce endlessly. Which, I mean, I guess is more primitive. Like at the end of the day, the animals are gonna... Yeah, I'm following the logic. Ronme uses her knowledge she gained through the simulated universe to replicate the Aeon's descendant in hopes that this would be the emanator of propagation. And she indeed had this from both Herta and Skrulin because they would have fucking killed her, let's be honest. A little bit of background on the swarm really quickly, but Tazeroth is again the Aeon of Propagation and owns the swarm. And the swarm is basically what you can think of as a locus throughout the entire universe. This stuff got so bad when it like arose that like four Aeons came together in order to deal with this. And it's still a problem to this day. Just like never ending duplicates of bugs. And of course, the voice memo ends with her wanting to seek out an assistant to help her deal with the situation because it's going to get dangerous. Oh, guess who is her assistant right now? And guess who got fed memory altering serum without her knowledge? So we can't even talk to anybody. So we can't even tell anyone about this. And guess who's absolutely cooked right now? We also, while we're there, take the time to check the visitor logs and it's Ron May and then alien species and then a man with a plaster head. What is going on right now? We return to the main area of the supply zone only to be greeted by Dr. Ratio. That is his name. I'm not making that up. That's actually his name. And this is the dude with the alabaster head and he's playing a game of chess by himself. Like he's like playing himself with himself. He's playing with him. Anyways, when we try to question Dr. Ratio to get to know who the hell he is, he lets us know to not waste our time with these answers because all of our answers are actually down below and he knows that we know what awaits us. And that brings us to Ron May's fucked up emanator creation. He does admit that after some pushback that he already knows who we are and the mistake that Ron May has made. So Dr. Ratio is already in the know. He's like, babes, I know you're fucked and I know she's fucked up. The only other information that we do get is about why he wears the alabaster head to which he replies he can't bear to look at idiots. I mean, Slate, I guess, like, oh, hey, pop off like king. <laughs> We then descend into the giant incubation room to be met with a massive incubator sphere cracked open. And just as we investigate, Skarkabaz, the emanator of propagation, appears ready to snatch us up for fucking breakfast. With our trusty bat, uh, we squish that gross fucking bug and immediately set forth to find Ron May and get some answers. Like, girl, you're supposed to be smart. Why are you so dumb? You know what? You don't even deserve the critters. You don't even deserve the critters. The critters are going here, away from you. Rodmay lets us know that the future of the simulated universe has been decided when it comes to partners, but decides to keep that a secret from us. She then admits she regrets her actions when it comes to the experiment, but it's more because it fell short of her goals, unless to deal with us almost dying or literally the entire space station. Apparently though, the bug actually only lasted 56 seconds on its own, which is about 52 seconds more than Dr. Ratio would last, so that's pretty good. It was a mere replica of the Emanator and not the real thing. It seems like replicated life, at least at this point, lacks stability. Ron May then goes on to talk about her critters and how they're beginning to grow on her. I don't I don't believe it. I honestly don't. I feel like she's coping. Like, I feel like she's just saying that because she knows she's supposed to say that. Although she doesn't see them as geniuses by any means, she is surprised at the emotional depth they were able to achieve. Now, the anti-truth serum that we were given early will begin to wear off soon and Ron May lets us know that we will forget this instance of time together but it won't happen all at once so she lets us know that it's going to be like a slow gradual thing where eventually we just forget. Honestly, when looking back at this quest line, you can tell Ron May doesn't really like this untrusting side of herself, but it admits that it stems from like an unknown trauma in her past. It is interesting though to see how she lives her life where it's completely skeptical of others, even her own friends around her. Before she leaves though, she gives us somewhat of some confirmation that the Miss Young Ching Tu is no longer with us and we most likely will run into each other again, hopefully 
hopefully. Hopefully, though, we're exploring the glacial no man's land together in the future. Ronmei does leave, giving us a confirmation that Young Ching Tu did indeed pass away, most likely. She also lets us know that we will indeed meet again. Hopefully, it's dealing with the no man's land and the glaciers. I think this all deals with her past storylines, but we'll have to obviously wait and see as Ronmei has it appeared since then. We make our way back to the master control zone in order to report back to Asta on Ronmei departing the space station, but come up empty-handed and unable to find her. We are then interrupted by a blaring news update on reports of the latest attacks on the space station, with the focus being on the researchers of the space station starting to protest upper management. See guys, I told you we would eventually circle back to this like five months later. On top of this, apparently an attack has occurred on Madame Herta and her whereabouts are currently unknown. At this point, we quickly make our way to Herta's office in hopes of finding one of her puppets, only to find Skrulem, Asta, and Dr. Ratio inside discussing the attacks. Now, Dr. Ratio is under the Intelligentsia Guild, which, by the way, is funded by the IPC. It seems the investigation is actually already underway. Now, we know the attack happened a few hours prior and was against one of Madame Herta's puppets. And they don't know where the puppet is and they can't find its signal. Also, there was no video footage of the attack because it happened outside of the station on a base. It doesn't seem like the actual Madame Herta was affected by this attack and she apparently received an invitation from the IPC just before the attack occurred, weirdly enough. And the number one suspect in this whole situation seems to be us because apparently we were the last ones to see her. Now, we try to recall previous events, but it seems like there are gaps in our memories. I just want to make this very clear, by the way. When I was playing through this, I thought it was something that had actually happened that we had went through, but it kind of alludes to this idea that there was stuff that happened in between the Ron May incident and this incident, and we're kind of going back through it, but it didn't happen on screen. Now, the only thing we were actually able to recall is the fact that Herta sent us to go look for a missing curio. And Dr. Ratio is apprehensive on taking our word at all. He basically launches into a full-on interrogation of picking apart our arguments and excuses. Even when we try to explain that we consulted with Asta about this missing curio, he gets all defensive, wondering why Asta wouldn't just mention that. Asta finally admits, though, that she had to keep this all on low profile because of how on edge the space station has been with upper management. And she's obviously worried that with another incident happening so close to the antimatter lead, invasions that this would just overall tank morale. What's even more wild though is this is when we also find out that the researchers have gone missing with absolutely zero leads or ideas on where they could have gone. Truly, the space station is falling apart at this point. Now, Arlen has already been tasked to look into these disappearances, and a researcher named Adler has been asked to go look into a possible curio that Herta was looking for. Now, Arlen came to find that the space station's automatic fire suppression system was momentarily activated around the time of the disappearances that had occurred, leading to the suspicion that spontaneous combustion had occurred at every single victim. So they're like, what? exploding into flames like this is good information because it gives us more to work with but also like maybe we hit the panic button now before everyone panics asta does chime in and lets us know that there are no traces of actual fires in the space station which leads everyone back to like zero like what is going on we decide at this point to see if these incidences are leaked by checking the records to see if herta's disappearance also had a log with the fire suppression system but before we're even able to do that another Another news alert goes off. This time, it being the Annihilation Gang, a faction of the destruction taking responsibility for the recent incidences in the space station and warning of future attacks. The news report then actually fully cuts as the Duke Inferno, which is the lead of the Everflame Maison, which is a sub-faction of the Annihilation Gang. There's like two of them. The Duke Inferno lets people know that the Annihilation will find you no matter the distance. Now, the Duke Inferno is also known as Ifrit and actually came from a star called Fitora. Now, Fitora was a white star that was infused with the power of destruction and is able to give birth to plasmic life forms. Yeah, I don't know. Apparently, if Nanook has sex with a star, it makes devils. Like, 
I don't, it doesn't make sense to me, but sure. With this message, it is very clear that Ifrit has declared war on the space station and honestly, the greater universe at this point. Now, Ratio thinks that the Annihilation Gang is a complete joke. What is interesting is the Annihilation Gang's entire thing is to impress Nanook and seek his gaze. I feel like this is also very similar to Ranume's creations looking for favor of their creator. I do wonder now if this was done on purpose as these quests run back to back with each other. Now, Ratio does inform us that the Annihilation Gang, like I said earlier, is divided into two sectors. The Everflame Maison is where the Duke Inferno is from, and the Japella Brotherhood is exactly the opposite of the Everflame Maison. This is a really weird thing that happens with factions in Hawkeye Star Rail, even though they're all under the same thing. Not every single, like, sub-faction thinks the same. For instance, the Genius Society and the Intelligentsia Guild kind of go at intelligence in different ways. Now, the Stellaran Hunters, mainly Kafka, actually incited a riot with in the Japella Brotherhood, causing its recent downfall. A little bit of tea there for you. Now, Asta isn't even just worried about the physical destruction that's coming from this incident, but also the destruction of trust that these new threats incite on the space station. Ratio then goes to Arlen to get information on missing researchers to see if there are any relationships or commonalities between them. Now, this is when we contact a woman named Pamela, who tells us she will give us the local gossip if we trade her pictures of Himiko. I wish I was lagging. This game is so unserious. Like, we literally got a girl in the space station that's running a whole gossip op with, like, the currency being Himeko feet pics. What's hilarious is we actually tell her to put it on our tab and she lets us know that she will get back to us if there were any news or anything new that comes up. This doesn't seem like this is the first time that we've talked to Pamela actually at this point. We try to reconnect with Adler to get some more information on that missing curio only to find out that Adler has recently disappeared as well. The space station at this point is just dropping like flies. Hilariously enough, Pamela does indeed get back to us and lets us know that the only thing connecting all of the disappearing research are the fact that they all posted on the dark web some extreme comments against management of the space station. So this is getting even worse because now we have an optics issue. If people find out about this, a lot of people are going to suspect that management is purposely making them disappear to avoid the uprising. Don Hung actually messages us out of nowhere, giving us some information on the Duke. And this is mainly about his abilities and his flame. It seems like his flame has the ability to shift between phases in a way of making him highly elusive. At this point, we return back to Dr. Ratio, Asta, and Screwlum, and decide to go over all of our findings at this point. It seems Dr. Ratio, though, has it all figured out. Adler came across vital information putting a target on his back, and all of the victims had influence in the space station through the dark web. And we also now know that the Duke Inferno has a special flame-like property that can be linked to these recent human combustions. That flame in particular is actually called a phase flame. And this is a flame that has the ability to pass through dimensions. Now the phase flame was actually discovered by the 29th Genius Society member Circle. And the phase flame is actually the missing curio that Herta has been looking for and most likely the Duke Inferno used it to gain access to the space station. I guess this is kind of similar to the whole Fragmentium situation where because there is phase flame present, the Duke could manipulate it in a way to allow him to get through. So this means the researchers didn't disappear or die, but instead were just like phased or moved somewhere else. This is where we come to realize that the Duke Inferno, aka Ifrit, most likely isn't going to attack, but his whole idea was to cause enough internal disruption that basically everything would unravel on its own without him even being physically there. Basically making the space station cause its own destruction. The Duke Inferno hoped that framing upper management with the disappearances once people started looking into the clues would eventually lead the space station to its own destruction. Now, just as the team seems to have everything all figured out, Asta bursts into flames and disappears right in front of the group. Skrillim reassures us, letting us know that the phase flame is actually a mere splinter of the original and lacks its actual phase shifting ability, meaning Asta and the others must be somewhere on the actual space station. It seems like this isn't the full phase flame and it's a less powerful version of it, so it can't actually go through dimensions. Skrillim heads to Herta's office to intercept the phase flame and prevent it from 
from getting any further. We head to the location of the flame currently with a doctor ratio in hopes of being able to intercept it. We pass through multiple phase flame walls, eventually whittling it down and cornering the phase flame as you pass through these dimensional rifts. While doing so, you can actually hear Ifrit have a bunch of voice lines telling you to stop it, telling you to get some help. The trailblazer tries to grab the phase flame and in doing so, it reacts with it, causing a dimensional portals to open up from the ceiling above. Through those portals, members of the Antimatter Legion quickly descend on you and you have to fight them off. Fighting off the Antimatter Legion weakens the fire to the point where Asta materializes from wherever she was being kept. Now she does seem in one piece though, but definitely is weakened and ends up recovering in the clinic of the space station. Sadly though, we do catch a glimpse of the phase flame escaping at the very end of the fight through one of the nearby walls. Skrillum lets us know that all of the researchers have been found thanks to Adler, the researchers came together and somehow found a way out of the curio themselves. Skrulum then goes to pursue the face flame that did escape and upon finding it he watches Dr. Ratio grab it for himself. This confirms Skrulum's internal thought processes that have been going on behind the scenes that Dr. Ratio knew everything that was going on all along. Now, Skrillum confronts Dr. Ratio on this, and he admits to it, and admits to letting things play out to see, almost as a test how the space station could do in a situation like this. Dr. Ratio actually believes that the erudition has no reason or logic to it. He goes on to talk about how they have geniuses throughout the universe, but ordinary people can't even trace their footsteps. I'm assuming that this is a dig at the Genius Society for never allowing their works to be deducted or worked through. They mainly just release answers and are very secretive to their internal structures and their rules. He also leaves with a slight diss on the Intelligentsia Guild, saying it's filled with mediocrity just like the space station. He does though leave behind a thought of an ominous struggle between the two major factions of the Erudition. Dr. Ratio uses the phase flame and leaves behind the spark for Asta and the space station. This actually ends the 1.6 quest line and it brings us finally to the conclusion of the Herta space station arc. We finally arrive on the Astro Express only to be greeted by a rather aggressive yet sweet pom-pom. I think it's a bunny, but it's not confirmed. It speaks, it's got a lot of sass, but regardless, it's honestly my favorite Hoyo mascot to date. To be fair, it is competing with Paimon, so the bar was in hell with Paimon. Pom-pom knocks us down, though, a peg or two by letting us know that although we are special, we are not that unique, and everyone on the Astral Express has their secrets. Okay, Miss A from Pretty Little Liars with all these little secrets here. All right, so we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on the Astral Express crew. Starting with March 7th, March 7th is actually named after the day of her rebirth and has one of the most interesting backstories in the Astral Express crew, in my opinion. The Astral Express crew was moving through space until it came upon a chunk of ice with March embedded within it. And she was naked, which is I don't, I don't know why we need to know that, but she is. After taking the ice inside, she woke up to friendly faces around her, but no idea who she was. March has a huge character story that's innately tied to photos and photography, and I think it's super interesting when it comes to a character all about memory and the loss of one's memory and the loss of one's self-identity. You can think of photos as March's own version of memory bubbles, or just in case if she ever gets sealed away in ice again, she will at least have her camera and its photos to remind her of her past adventures in times with the Astral Express crew. For those that don't know what memory bubbles are, they come from Fuli and they're a way to retain memories in a more physicalized form. Now, March doesn't actually have an official role within the Astral Express and it is a textbook definition, like I said, of personality hire. Though, with her backstory, I'm sure Himiko has other reasons for keeping her around. It does seem March's backstory, though, will have a huge possible tie-in to the remembrance and coming to understand who 
or what removed her memories and how she can possibly retrieve them. All right, the next major character, obviously, that we should talk about in the Astro Express is John Hung. I'm gonna be honest, John Hung's major story will most likely all be covered in part three, where his entire story is focused on. So I think it just makes sense and is more likely to be extremely relevant then to go over his backstory at that point, because you also have all the information to understand it. Now, Himiko's story is definitely an interesting read. It talks about someone traveling day and night aimlessly as days pass in a state of exhaustion. We're unsure what precedes these moments and how Himiko got to that point, but in her exhausted travels, she comes across a stranded astral express. Now, due to Himiko's previous studying of interstellar travel, she is somehow on her own able to repair the train and relaunch it herself. Now, in these moments, this is where Himiko comes to accept her current journey as the trailblazer. Himiko seems to be the current oldest member of the Astral Express crew. It is kind of unknown what or who was on the Astral Express before it crashed on Himiko's planet. And to my knowledge, we don't know what the planet's name is yet. A final thing that's pretty interesting about Himeko is that her story even lets us know that members of the Astral Express will come and go before Himiko's journey truly comes to an end. There's honestly so much to learn about Himiko's story and I cannot wait to find out about it. We aren't given a ton to work with, but it seems like that story will be coming in the future when it makes sense. All right, the one and only Welt. Now, Welt has an extremely complicated past and it actually directly relates to his character within Honkai Impact 3rd. For those that don't know what Honkai Impact 3rd is, it is another game by Hoyoverse that they have made before they even made Genshin. I think it is currently in six or seven years. And in the end of Honkai Impact 3rd, Welt ends up, which we now know, in the world of Honkai Star Rail. Although extremely interesting, it's currently kind of out of scope to explore fully when it comes to his character in Honkai Impact 3rd. In future, if more of Honkai Impact 3rd and its story ties into the game, then we'll definitely revisit Welt and his history. What we will cover, though, is Welt and his brief past in this world. Now, Welt and his blonde companion, who we come to know to be Void Archives, travel through a portal in search of an alien species seeking out this world, Star Rail, for its inevitable destruction. Now, these aliens are known as Sky People in Honkai Impact 3rd, but have not had reference in Honkai Star Rail yet. Now, an unknown amount of time passes and Kimiko travels to the world of Salsado to pick up something for Herta. She then ends up seeing a signal out in space and upon investigating, it comes upon Welt and Void Archives stranded in space. She ends up rescuing them and as payback, both Welt and his friend join Kimiko's express team. At some point in the future, Void Archives ends up leaving the express sometime after due to unmanageable differences. We're currently unsure if Don Hung got to meet Void Archives, but we are sure that March 7th never did. So it was definitely before the rescue of March 7th. Welt seems to have a ton of knowledge also on Stellarons and the world, even though he's only been a part of this world for a short period of time, most likely. Let me also remind you, he has the innate ability to subdue a Stellaron and his abilities all actually focus on gravity and matter manipulation. Welt, of course, also has a lot of mystery behind him and it'll be interesting to see if sky people play a role in the story at some point. Now, beyond being a somewhat bunny-related race and genderless, we have little to zero information on Pom Pom. We don't even really know how Pom Pom joins the Express or if they've been there the entire time. Himiko literally does not recall how Pom Pom or when Pom Pom got there, which is like crazy because Himiko is the one that's been there the longest. My personal theories is that Pom Pom is just the spirit of the Astral Express, like a physical version of the essence or like the being that is the train. Jumping back to the story though, the crew prepare for a warp after we reach an acceptable distance away from the Herta space station. Now, March actually tries to stay fully upright during the jump, like the warp jump. She's like, hold on, can I, can I, can I do this? And Welt happily lets us know that feeling dizzy after the warp is to be expected. Himiko tells us that our first stop is on Yarillo 6. And apparently it's been thousands of years since the Express actually paid a visit. The warp goes as planned. And as we arrive, Himiko is stunned to see the current state of the planet. Once a lush green planet now is covered in a sheet of consistent winter and ice. On top of that though, Pom Pom lets us know that our planned seven day stop has now 
now been extended indefinitely as the train is experiencing instability. Now, we believe that this is because of a local Stellaron. Himiko then lets us know that she also believes that the current state of the planet itself is most likely connected to the Stellaron as well. She then assigns this mission to March, Don Hung, and us as well as a sort of warm up. Apparently, though, Nanook has his eye on the Astro Express, and it's valuable that someone stays on the ship just in case. And there you have it, our first major chapter in arc in this story. In the end, Don Hung, March, and the Trailblazer are ready to descend onto the planet, find the Stellaron, bring it home, and I'm sure there will be a ton of drama and interesting things happening while they're going through that process. As always, though, thank you guys so much for watching. I really, really, really hope you enjoyed this first part in the unhinged recap of Hawkeye Star Rail. If you did, again, please, it means so much for you to hit subscribe and like. Comment down below your favorite part. Comment down below what you want to cover, who you want me to cover, or any other interesting things. As always, I'm going to try my best to get part two to you guys as soon as possible. It'll be what I work on right away after this. And I plan on actually bringing more lore videos in the future. So if you have an idea and it doesn't have to be a game with Hoyoverse, feel free to let me know down below. I already have a lore video planned for The Legend of Zelda, so keep that in mind. But if you have other games that you would like me to explore and try out, I'm always willing to get suggestions. Anyways, that is all. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you in the next one.